Testing. Testing. Hello everyone, I'm Liron Cohen and I'm Mimi Torchin and we are Lady Parts TV and today we're doing another interview, this is like the third in less than 10 days. Wow, we're working more than we did before <laughs> the pandemic. Um, but we have something very special for you today and actually I'm amazed it took us so long to do this since uh, Nicole Kahn, our interviewee today, uh, has been the a friend for quite a Nicole long time. Kahn. The Nicole Kahn, uh, lesbian icon, filmmaker, extraordinary, uh, <laughs> uh, maker of uh, Claire of the Moon, Ellen Andan, A Perfect Ending, and now More Beautiful for Having Been Broken. And she is going to sit here and talk with us about everything. Her and More Beautiful for Having Been Broken. And everything. I mean, we have lots of questions. So uh, sit down, relax, and enjoy. Uh, grab a beer, <laughs> grab a soda, grab a glass of water. And join us for a conversation with Nicole, Nicole Kahn. Kahn. Hi, Nicole. Hi, Nicole. Hey, Mimi and Liron. Very, Very good. good. Did you practice that? Because my favorite little gals from New York. Oh, well, we love you, Nicole. You, so you know that. Much. Thank Can you. I just say something to your audience? You two are two of the dearest, sweetest, most adorable people. These two women have helped me since a perfect ending. Um, you actually brought me Barbara, I believe. that, And I knew Barbara, but you knew Barbara well. I knew Barbara. Well. Barbara actually brought me to That's you. True. That's right. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the best gifts ever because I just enjoy you two so much. The well, feeling is completely you, mutual. Thank you. We feel very uh, lucky to be in your inner circle. Yes, <laughs> in my inner inner circle <laughs> well we love you and we can't believe you took us so long to do this i know we've I been know. talking about it for years yes we have been is this literally our first interview it, our first it interview. is but we wanted to really to wait we wanted to wait for uh yeah the for, new more movie, for more perfect more perfect more, more beautiful <laughs> for having been oh god oh no more beautiful for, for having, having been, been broken, broken. I'm putting have, a perfect ending in with more beautiful. We're gonna yep. have lots to talk about because actually, I, you know, yes. we we know uh, we're friends, but I've never researched you, and there isn't that much out uh, about you. Um, so we want to first of all tell people, you know, get get people to know you, the woman behind the legendary movies, but also like all these weird facts that I learn about you that I'm like, really? So, for example, did you really study business? Yes. Why? I went to, I went to accounting college because. I, and when I first started out, my, my stepfather had always told me, you will never make a living as a writer. You can write on the side, do whatever, blah, blah, blah. So I would, I would get up at like four in the morning, work on a, a novel and had to do the accounting for two construction firms that I was there, um, sort of their comptroller for, for years as I worked in the mornings. So you started out writing novels. <laughs> yes. Sorry, that's Lady Gods. Hey, 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 sweetie. Wait a minute. We love pets. Yeah, gotta see my girl. So oh, oh, she so is my sweet, sweet love. She just lost her little sister to oh. coyotes. Here. <gasps> oh, puppers, my little beautiful puppers. Oh, that's she so terrible. Like a year and a half, and uh, oh my god, she got out for a few minutes, and that was all it took. Oh <laughs> no, that I'm must so be sorry. feeling bolder. Pardon me. Oh, and they are here in LA. They're they're all over the place. Well, especially now because people aren't around. This is my special lady bug. She's gorgeous. What's her name? Ladybug. Lady Buzz. Lady Buzz. Her older brother was Sir Byron. You know, for Byron. So very nice. Very yes. sweet. Puppers was Princess Puppers at one point. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, Royal I'm so sorry for of our rescue dogs. Okay. Yes. Well, um, so when did you decide that you? I mean, so you started as a novel writer, actually novelist yes and yeah, when actually I actually after I did Claire of the Moon I, I got a three book deal with Simon Schuster and they wanted to they wanted to start a gay and lesbian imprint so the first novel of mine that they did was uh, Passion Shadow which bizarrely enough I used those characters from Passion Shadow to become the basis of More Beautiful <laughs> and oh, so man. I always wanted to do that film but it's it requires all kinds of architectural stuff and things going on in it that I simply couldn't afford to budget in so I decided to use the mother daughter uh, lover trio of them and started it out that way so that's where they're from so and when did you 
did you study filmmaking or did you just, were you just a natural? Were you a savant? <laughs> what? Uh, um, well, I, I, I have been blessed with a very high IQ, my mother tells me. And um, so I basically am autodidactic. Everything I do, I've learned myself. With film, I actually, the film that made me decide I want to give that feeling to people was Desert Hearts. I saw oh. it green. Evergreen, uh, the Evergreen Campus in Washington, they were doing a, a lesbian festival that I had never even heard there was such a thing. So I drove up three hours, sat through hours and hours and hours of films. And one of the last films I saw was Desert Hearts. And the entire drive down to Portland from Seattle, all I could think about was I have to figure out how to make that feeling happen for other people. And that was it. And so I, in Portland, the film community was extremely small at that time, but they still uh, brought out productions because it was cheaper. And I met my producer because I rented a room to her, Pam Curry from Claire of the Moon. And when she uh, lived with me, she taught me everything because she was a um, an assistant director and production manager down in LA for studio features. And so she was working with the best, uh, Joel Schumacher. I mean, you name it, she was working with them. So she gave me my start. And when we decided to do Claire of the Moon, I asked her if she'd produce it and she agreed and that was sort of it. And it was after then that I actually got the three book deal with Simon Schuster. I'm sure Donna Deitch would be very happy to know she was your inspiration. She actually was my inspiration. We actually wanted to ask you, ask you that your, question. So and, and we wanted to ask you what your favorite lesbian movie that was not yours. Uh, so is it still Desert Hearts? No, no, no. My favorite lesbian movie. <laughs> Nobody's probably ever heard of it. Is Entre Nous. I oh, love I love Entre Nous. Is, is that the so French? much? There's literally no sex in it, but the character Miu Miu and Isabel Hubert, oh my oh, God, God, they freaking kill me both, especially Miu Miu. She, or is it Miu Miu Miu? Miu Miu, I'm not sure how you say her name. Yeah, she's so, oh my God. The, t the Whatever it was between the two of them, that delicate, sexual dance was and the intense emotional feelings behind it was just just moved me in and another one is fire the indian film fire oh, oh, yes. fire fire Absolutely. is a devastating Absolute, film but it's uh favorites so you made claire of the moon when you were how old 33 and how long was the process of actually since because uh, uh, the novel came first i guess no 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 i wrote the novelization after because oh, really? barbara greer of naiad press at the time when she figured out that I was doing this lesbian movie and it had been seven years since Desert Hearts, she basically said, can you, I know you're a writer. Can you write a novelization? I said, sure, you know, I'll give it a buzz. And um, that novelization went on to through 20 reprints. I mean, wow. it's just, yeah. Clear of the Moon is the film that keeps on giving. I just still can't believe how many young people see it and, and like it because it's so clunky in terms of filmmaking. And, you know, it was my first effort. In the first 25 minutes, I can barely sit through. <laughs> but after that, I think the film really works. I was going to say, you've gotten much better. We just oh, rewatched yeah. it. But you know what? It Considering that it's in a specific time period, it was your first, it kind of still holds up. I think Especially the relationship. Uh, it's something we have later on, but I'm just going to say it now yeah. anyway. You... I think one of your greatest gifts that happens in every one of your films, including Claire of the Moon, is the way you build a relationship, the way you take your time and let it grow and let it organically. marinate. It has, because, feels uh, very organic. It never feels rushed. And by the time we get to it, mm -hmm. we're, we're so ready. Yeah. They're so ready. Um, I, and you do that in every one of your films, and it's really a great, great gift, I feel. Because especially in Claire of the Moon, the way that they start off, I was like, oh, my God, are we expected to believe that these two are going to want to be together? And you just did it so well that, you know, it just it, it happened kind of slowly, and it just felt right. And um, I think that there were a lot of also a lot of philosophical ideas that were, I think still resonate. Uh, some yeah. really great lines that I'm sorry, I've already forgotten. But, uh, <laughs> but like when you eat pussy, you eat pussy. <laughs> <laughs> that is very have, philosophical. I have no idea how much that line was the hugest battle between myself and my publicist and the distributors and everything else. And I said, that is the s synthesis of this entire movie. And you can't take it out because Faith McDivitt playing, you know, Maggie, 
that's exactly what she would say. So, um, so Pam Curry was the only person who agreed that we should absolutely keep the film that in the film, and so we did. Well, actually, we wanted to ask you because this was 1992. Not too many yeah. lesbian movies were made at the time. It was your first movie, so it's not like you had clout in the industry. What was None. that? What was that process like? Well, it was really interesting because it was sort of like you know, sort of like an overnightish success on some levels, mm-hmm. but I didn't understand or realize that at the time and didn't take advantage of it at the time or do anything smart or, you know, professionally wise at the time. Um, but it was, it, it came out and was a huge thing. And it got LA critics pick in the LA weekly of uh, the Los Angeles time, Kevin, wow. I mean, the reviews from the Boston Globe, New York times, LA, everybody in the straight universe loved it because it, it talked about what it meant to be a lesbian And so the Q and A's at festivals were huge. We were in Toronto and just literally everywhere. We were one of the premier, we were one of the premier, premier films that um, Robert Redford picked for the Sundance channel. We were one of the 10, Wow, that channel. Yeah. And the thing though, that I most, most, most proud about, it was the first film of our kind for our, for our community that had ancillary and that ancillary became its own cottage industry. And what does that mean? Okay, Ancillary's Merchandise. The Making of Claire of the Moon was the first making of of any lesbian movie ever. And it spawned a, a, a family of those, like Bar Girls, the Making of Bar Girls and Girl Trash and everything else. Not Girl Trash. Um, girl, girl Bar. Tra- girl Talk. It was a play that became a movie. Then there was a making of, I th- I believe that's what it was. But um, soundtrack, book on tape, um, T-shirts, slicks. We did this entire set of slicks. Uh, that you remember the gals you met in the global, uh, in the mm-hmm. no, no, no con films lab, or show and Patty, they had a, a company called Alternative Creations. And they traveled to all the festivals and s- sold all this Claire of the Moon artwork, sculptings, you name it, we had it. For seven years, we did that. Merch, merchandise. Yeah, merch, merch. In fact, because we only had 12 prints of the film, ma- the making of, people saw that before they saw the movie. Wow. We would have the making of in the popcorn stands in the theaters. Claire of the Moon ran for 18 months. In, in the theaters. It, it ran theatrically for, for 18, 18 months. months. Yes. From region to region to region. Because it stayed there for weeks and weeks and weeks because lesbians had nothing else. Back in the day when lesbians would actually go to a movie theater. As we now know, they do not. But that <laughs> well, is Nobody that is, does. That is once yes. it was out. But how hard was it to get it out? It wasn't get- hard to get it out at all because there was nothing like it. It was the easiest distribution deal I ever made. I didn't even know what I was doing. Wow. Um, and we were able to do what we're doing now with More Beautiful, which was we were able to bifurcate the deal with Fox Lorber as well as Strand Releasing, which was a gay boys releasing. They did all of the theatrical. And Nyad Press did the VHS to sell to all the women who uh, read books. And that's why she had me do the novelization. So that's how all of that sort of came about. And that's did- amazing. Yeah. That's if you build it, they will come. That And this is what we said. If you book it, they will come. That was our mantra through the mm-hmm. entire thing. So, yeah. It now, was, this it was, was quite a ride. This was you saying that you, you, you didn't know to do any of the right things afterwards. It took you 20 years to make Ellen and Dan, almost, right? After that. No, because what I did then is I went into novel writing and uh, scripts and things along those lines. I was just telling Lisa, because we're uh, I sent her a script that I wrote for Joan Collins. I wrote it specifically for her. And I back in the days when I was paid by the week to be a producer writer. And it was wonderful, making a wonderful living and all of those sorts of things. And um, yeah, uh, I did a lot of things like that. What I learned in that period of time between then and when I did Little Man, Mm-hmm. was this there. town is fast track to the slow no and hurry up and wait. And between those two pieces, I realized, I don't know if I'm ever going to get anything out there except for the books that had you know been published. And so um, when I had done some shorts uh, in between that time and some other stuff working for other people, directing for other people. And then when Little Man happened, um, right. you know, I was actually, I think I told you, doing a document documentary about surrogacy, and then uh, Nicholas came so early that it became all about him. So that film did uh, pretty well, didn't it? Oh, it did the best of all my films. <laughs> yeah. Little Man. Yeah, because it, Showtime picked it up and for seven years ran it like 
endlessly. I got so many people responding to that film and uh, Showtime did an Emmy campaign on it and we did an Oscar campaign. Wow. With Just one of those. Yeah. Melissa Gilbert from um, uh, Little yes, House. Very. Very called me she said I have two preemies and you need to talk to my stepfather who is the guy who will get you an Oscar so it was like you know and so that was really fun to live you know sort of in those experiences and everything and um, again not realizing what I should have been doing with my career which was the minute Claire of the Moon happened I should have just had my agent send me out on everything but I didn't and the beauty of it is I guess is that I ended up doing my own films ultimately which having to talk to so many other friends and pals who are TV writers and work in writing rooms and all of those, they never get their work out there. You know, it's always a combination of 20 writers or showrunners where they are doing these shows and they're working around the clock, but they don't get creative control. And so from that standpoint, I feel like based on who I am and my own self I probably would never make it in that kind of world anyway so yeah we, we were going to we ask you because uh, I, I'm always I, I was always surprised not to see your name on any of the Elwood episodes because they always try to hire you know from within the community oh, yeah no I just never I just never went that route and in fact pretty much stayed exclusive well exclusively into the indie um you know micro indie film for women even though you know you'd never get rich doing it um, I didn't know that I wouldn't get rich. I didn't think about it too much because it sort of was just what I was so passionate about. But as time has gone by, as I've explained to you all, um, it's just become financially not viable at, at all anymore for me. And that's one of the reasons, and we'll talk about this later, that mm -hmm. we need to go sort of funding model. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we will talk about it later. Um, well, but between, I was just want to ask, between Claire of the Moon and Elena and Dan, which were the two big lesbian, you know, uh -oh. one big lesbian movie and then another big lesbian movie, um, did you feel any change in making movies for lesbians in those 20 years? Well, you have to understand with Claire of the Moon, I, I ended up having to go to therapy for two and a half years over it because the San Francisco and New York lesbians hated the movie and loathed the Ex movie. Specifically the New York and San Francisco lesbians? Specifically New York and San Francisco because they were basically our lesbian literati and they were our political voices and they were the ones who were running the big rags like The Advocate and stuff along those lines. This is how much San Francisco hated the movie. They scheduled in their, at Frameline, and then they trashed it in the program. So we pulled it from that program. And then we got a horrific review in the San Francisco Bay Chronicle. And then the same woman who reviewed that reviewed the book that I wrote and trashed me completely. And then she reviewed the audio version of the book and trashed me. <laughs> Just looking for opportunities to trash you. Well, well this is... A and like Christine Vachon, who put in the advocate, if if Nicole Kahn is a lesbian, I give up my ID card, you know, it's like. Why? What is, why? Because the film was so romantic and had two beautiful women up there and that did not represent us. You know, we weren't these women up there. These were a Hollywood version of women and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you know, I would say, I'm just really not a political filmmaker. And they would scream at me, every frame of film is political and you need to be careful with what you're doing, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so, so has that changed? Yes and no. I mean, yeah. I still feel like there is a, I think it's hysterical that Christine Vachon was involved with Carol, which is one of the most lush romantic movies after all of this time. I think it's our so, favorite. And actually, we wanted to ask you about if you have messages in your films that you want people to hear, or are you really just into making romantic love stories? No, the message is very, very clear. We need these films. We need these films to balance our lives from, well, like, uh, let's forget today. We need this, these films today because our lives are completely out of balance. We're dealing with an administration that is literally dealing in another reality from the 50% of America, which is so insanity making. We need it for those reasons and we need it with COVID-19 as like I say, the antidote to the pain of what we're experiencing. But there is literally just not enough movies about romance. And getting back to your thing about the way that it's built organically, um, I was explaining to somebody the other day, for me, romance boils down to one thing and it's attention to details. 
So if you're paying attention to those details, those are all the pieces that make up, you know, the eye looks, the swallows, the, you know, accidentally touching them, realizing you're touching, all of those things that we love to feel when we're engaging in a new relationship are all the details of that romance. And that's what I try to present as the characters grow. So that's that's why all those film, all my films have that characteristic. And also, I was just thinking about it, of the four major romantic films that you made, uh, three are about a straight woman discovering her lesbian sexuality not necessarily that she's a well yes they're lesbians uh and there's a such a an an attention but none of it is about a big coming out no, story no no it's about, about realizing it's about falling it's in about love the personal with a journey and you it's about women who realize who they are because they fall in love with a woman and um there's a lot of romantic tension in that uh, that story, that anybody who's lived it knows that that push me, pull me, push me, pull me until yes. you can't pu I I can't push yeah. you anymore. Yeah, and a part of it is is that that very first time that you realize you're falling in love with a woman is one of the most delicious experiences there is. Period, and that's one of the reasons. And I also just from my personal experience, I've been with quite a few straight women. And so that's one of the reasons as well, because I that's sort of been my experience. Well, and also though, these days, I, I, I think, because we are kind of everywhere yeah. now, it's yeah. easier to find lesbian, you know, characters and storylines, but it's missing that thing that used to be because it was forbidden yeah. and it used to be in the subtext and hidden. Yeah. And so yeah. that when, you know, that kind of, of movie, like, adds to the you know the it, it lends itself to that let's get uh, back to elena and um, which is my favorite it's it's many oh, people's so favorite there are your little videotape things that you guys are sending me what is that the video i've been asking everybody to send me little test oh like, that's right that's oh, right. right we should do one yes. for sure because we and tell 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 everybody okay, about it so i can tell everybody it won't happen until july we were going to be doing this at Clexicon, which would have been what this weekend or something Gee. to re-release the uh, Elena Undone for its 10th anniversary. And Marina Rice Bader, who was our executive producer and my then partner, and the story is about us, um, and Jane Clark, our producer. Wait, the, the story is about you. Okay, we'll have to get back to that. <laughs> I don't know that no. Elena... No way. That's me and Marina's story. Wow. No wonder it's so good. <laughs> it's completely... I mean, practically every scene outside of not having six kids on the screen is our story completely well no wonder it works that, no wonder that, it rings so true is that common knowledge did we miss something well it was in all of our press oh okay <laughs> it's not a secret at all oh well, that's okay. why that's i guess that's why it's so good how could that how could you guys not know that that's so interesting i don't know <laughs> uh, uh we uh you know so she you, was the, the person who basically got me back into filmmaking at that time. I was doing a handbook guide for um, uh, for preemies uh, with my business partner from Preemie World because the premature experience obviously really super affected me. So there was no guide to help mothers with the terminology. So I wrote basically a terminology book with my partner and the, my business partner, and we still sell that today. So. That was just a diversionary side tracking of it. And then Marina had said to me, why aren't there no good lesbian films out there? And I said, oh, God, don't even get me started. And uh, so, so Marina is in the car. Yes. Elena. <laughs> well, um, first of all, I, I want to know, how did you when you how did you get talk to us about the casting of these two, Tracy and the car? Because that was magic. That was chemistry magic. And that's so rare. Yes. Well, um, we basically, Jane had put Nakar and Tracy in a small short called The Touch. And so she introduced us to both of them. But I didn't have the, the, the script written for a Persian, uh, Iranian, Middle Easterner. So I wasn't even, I, I was like, she's not right for the part. And she said, just read her and, and look. I was like, no, no, no. She said, I'm going to send you her, her stuff. And I was like, whatever. Um, but I was completely sold on Tracy for the Peyton role. And um, so we did all of our casting around 
Tracy to find, you know, somebody who had really good chemistry with her. And um, I will never forget <laughs> when Nakar walked into the casting, Jane called her and I said, because I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it. It was, I, we were close several times. I just couldn't find it. So she's like, well, she's going to be a little late. And so I was off in the bathroom. I walk in, I sit down and this woman comes in with this hair out like this. She turns around and smiles at me. And I literally put my, I just went like, fuck, you are beautiful. <laughs> she I is. Said that. And um, it was like, they did their rehearsals. I, I was just like, fuck. She's a she's she's, so, she's a sexy woman. She's got so much oh, un she's everything. So she's good. oh, she's, she's such a so wonderful good. actress. She is so so talented. She's so nuanced. She's yeah. just everything reads on her face. Yeah. Every she has that voice. She I'm uh, clearly but she's kind, also, of, kind of mad for her. But she's also charming. I mean, she's on one hand she's sexy, mm -hmm. and on the other hand she's, she's kind warm. of there's something so sweet about her. And yeah, I know. I know. It was perfect. I, you know, I thought everybody would be so madly in love with Nakar that Tracy would be like ignored. But Tracy, oh my God, yeah. the two of them. Yeah, just, together they were just incendiary. That, that's the thing about good chemistry. You, they bring each other up. So yeah. you know, uh, Tracy was lovely. But actually, we cut you off when you were talking about uh, what should people do about the Ellen and then uh, re release that you want people to see. Oh, you right. Videos. Yes, yes. Well, so because so many people and, and on all of my sort of like uh, pitch sheets, I have all of these things where people say, I've seen Elena and Dunn over 50 times. I've seen Elena a hundred times. I've seen Elena and Dunn every day for the whole last month. You know, it's my pick me up thing. I watch it every Friday night. We do movie night, whatever. I wanted to get all those little clips to cut into our new trailer. So that's what I'm looking for. Ladies, please. 30 seconds, 10 seconds, even say, I've watched it 20 times. You know, a video. I, Wait, yes. Horizontally. Horizontally. Um, right. I saw you yes. I saw you say that, right. Yeah. Um and just shoot it in your your uh, your um your home because we don't go house. anywhere. Uh, whatever. And then send it to assistant at NicoleCon dot com. Okay. And we'll be using it in the trailer and for social media. Perfect. So please, 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 if you're an Elena Undone fan, please send me that. Oh, I love it. So now you had you broke a record with Elena Undone. You had yeah. the longest on screen kiss. One yeah. take. It seemed like yeah. one take. Four. No, I mean, no, one, four no. take. Yeah. Four one takes. Four. Yeah. You one only had to do it four times to get that? That four times. The first take, the guy made it through a minute and a half and he just fell apart because it, there was so much steady cam movement. So it wasn't even the girls <laughs> that had That's to. Not, <laughs> girl. it, was, it was the cameraman the first time. But um, when we shot that, uh, it was so blocked. Blocked, I mean rehearsed literally every moment of every piece had to be rehearsed because of the timing. And so this phase had to begin here and stop here. And this phase had to be in it and did it, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, and uh, that came about because, because we were, Marina and I were talking about, um, cause Marina was an exceptionally amazing kisser. And one of the things that we talked about was the first time we kissed, we ended up kissing for like seven hours. And so it was like, how do you capture that first kiss, you know, and where everything just falls away from the world and you're just so inside it that, you know, and that's it. And then I started doing research about uh, what film, what film had the longest kiss. And it was from you're in the army now from way back in the forties. And it wasn't, you know, it's kind of, fake how they did it this is a real kiss that lasts for that long and i'm really glad that it belongs to two women so yes and yeah. how how long was it 12 three no three minutes and three minutes 314 or 317 i, I don't know why my brain is not so you set so you set out to break a record yes and i said really? if it doesn't work organically we'll we'll you know i'll cut the kiss differently and i did cut it a couple of different i mean i cut it a lot of different ways but the their third take was like it now we did do some things in um special effects in terms of moving the camera in a slightly different way so that we could make it all feel very fluid and it took it took a lot of work to get that scene together but it it was worth it yeah. is the re-release by the way going to have any uh new special features that didn't uh that you did uh, before well we somewhere i have the first audition kiss between them that nobody's ever seen which is Ooh. one of uh, yeah um because it was very, very, it was up at our house, but I have to find, Marina and I were both talking about 
We have no idea where all of our drives are and what's on them. And I have a totally different system now. So I have to like figure out how to convert everything. And, but we're, we're working on it. That's good. And would you ever consider an Elena Undone sequel? I'm sure you've been asked. I've been asked for a sequel for every movie, every single movie, the fans who love that movie want a sequel. And I feel like when you make a movie like that, it is so hard and so in that that work is so intensified for a good year, year and a half that you're just completely as the director anyway, consume, 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 consume that at some point you literally do get to the point where you're freaking sick of the movie. And, um, and then you fall back in love with it when you see it in theaters with, you know, with people. Uh, and to me, I don't know what that story would look like. You know, it doesn't, there's nothing organically that comes to me um, about what that story looks like. So, okay, I, I guess. Think. Well, then let me just advocate for you to cast my car in another movie. <laughs> I do a totally, a take on every main lesbian movie called Curious Wine, W-H-I-N-E, because we're such big babies about everything, <laughs> and use characters and actors that were Helen Shaver, and all of them. And have them all be like meeting at some lesbian thing and doing lesbian like you know. fanfic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> well, um, we have, by the way. Uh, oh, well, before we get to the uh, the first audience question, um, you've done four major lesbian inclusive films thus far. I know you have already some in the in the pipeline. Um, tell us in a few lines. Describe the experience of making each one of them. Well, Claire of the Moon was a phenomenal experience because uh, this is no secret. I had a mad affair with Trisha Todd and it was like the most uh, wonderful experience from that standpoint, because we fell so madly in love right before the filming started. And um, I think that helped really carry it. And we weren't the only one who was, who were having an affair. There were, everybody was sleeping with everybody on that. Lesbians. It Very was like, funny. Oh, never actually slept. And we were all staying in my house and the beach house and the, this hotel that we were staying at. And we'd always see women running from each other's rooms out to each other's rooms because we had a large uh, women's crew. But we also had, you know, a lot of straight men. It was one of the best working experiences ever. It was really, really awesome. Lots of sex. Yeah, that's a secret. Lots of sex. Lots of sex. Um, and then... Um, little man just happened inside my home for two and a half years. So that was literally my, I think my uh, compartmentalizing to try to survive the experience of it because it was so brutal. And then um, uh, Elena Undone was a really wonderful experience because it was about Marina and I, and we shot it out of our home and all of those sorts of things. So it, that was a, that was, it was a harder, it was kind of a hard experience for me in, in some ways, but in other ways it was, um, it was just, it was a, it was kind of a difficult shoot on some levels. And then um, a perfect ending was probably what I would say was my peak when I shot that film, because I was able literally to do so many things at the same time and feel really, really on top of what my game essentially. And um, because it was much more of an artistic expression for me, mm -hmm. it really fed me artistically in the same way that, more beautiful, which has been the hardest bar none film that I've ever dealt with. It's been the hardest uh, climb, challenge, uh, brutal, uh, awful in many, many, many ways. Um, so many people, you know, know the story as you do that I lost my brother, my sister, and my father all within 22 months of each other, and losing my sister uh, to a very violent suicide did me totally in. And so um, between that and Nicholas's being hospitalized during that same time twice to the point where, um, you know, uh, palliative care came to talk to me to, you know, put a DNR on him both times. I was, a, a, I, I, I broke. I mean, there's just no other way around it. I broke completely abused a bunch of drugs and alcohol. Um, Barbara Niven and Sue Melke at the time helped me. Uh, get into treatment. And um, I'm very, very grateful to them for that. And uh, after I got out of very, very intensive treatment, about six months later, 
the world just was completely different for me. I mean, completely. And what was important to me was completely different. And what I wanted to do with the film um, wasn't any different other than I really needed to show the beauty of everyday moments when you heal and appreciate the, the smallest things in life to be the most beautiful things. And the fact that you can recover from the, that kind of trauma, you know, sort of like relentless trauma and get to the other side of it and hopefully yeah. have survived and become a lot wiser. I mean, I don't sweat any of the small stuff now at all, <laughs> you know, and I, the one thing I do know is the things I don't want in my life. And I'm very, very clear about that and finally feel like I finally grew up at 60. So, um, you know, uh, yes, it was, it's been a very long climb with this movie. Well, it's and, a beautiful film. And throughout, throughout it all is, is, is making the film. Is that something that, that nurtures you and that you, you wait for as a way to put all that other stuff aside and just nurture your soul? That's good. Yeah. It, it, the, my artist soul is completely fed because um, I have complete creative control over everything. I'm able to just completely immerse myself in that experience. Like when I'm editing, you, you know, you won't see me for weeks at a time because I'm literally like from the minute I get up after my walk to, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve. 10, 12, who knows what time it is I'm editing because that's a specific kind of groove you get into. Um, and because I fell so in love with the characters and more beautiful, it was very easy to nurture and love them inside the editing process, mm -hmm. and everything else. And um, even the music, I, you know, I sat with Nami um, over and over and over to um, help guide where, how I wanted the music to feel because I wanted it to feel beautiful and lush, but also to have a sort of, yearning delicacy which is really i think she really captures both in freddie's theme and in the love theme um, which is my favorite piece of music ever mm -hmm. uh, so Beautiful. yeah and the score is available on itunes ladies so that's good to know it's a very good score it is all your music is good and all, yeah, all, all your films are available. I think lesbians are kind of known for having good good music good music good yeah. music um i wanted to ask you before this is not a question we had ready but i just i you're you're openness and your honesty about everything personal and you know about how personal your movies are and all your experiences it comes out so naturally and i'm sure that too many people who are watching this or have read about you um not not everybody feels you know that they can be as open about all their personal experiences is that something that well, um i think that uh you know to sort of hide that that those parts of myself just doesn't seem to make sense to me because um and part of it is also for people to understand the donors and investors, you know, why the hell it took me so long to get this movie done. Um, it was just fraught with one thing after, after another. And because of all the personal sort of challenges that came my way, um, and because I survived them, <laughs> I'm goodness. happier to talk about them. Had I not survived them, you wouldn't know, <laughs> but, um, it's sort of like, um, I also, uh, I went to a very specialized grief group for suicide, but victims of suicides, families and stuff, and uh, discovered that one of the things that helped me was talking to people who had that specific experience. And so from that standpoint, it's sort of like a 12 stepping thing for me as well, because um, because I don't really tell 12 steps through the program, I try to do it in other ways. Mm -hmm. And so that's another reason I let people know, because I get emails and and uh, communications all the time from people who have experienced something similar, like whether they were a preemie mother or suffered a suicide and we engage and it, it it's, um, it's really healing and it's really wonderful. Well, so. it's very generous too. Uh, your audience, I think, uh, feels, uh, the reality, uh, that, that goes into your films. Um, there, there's a, there's a, Based on every one of them is based on something real. I don't know how to pull. I mean, a lot of stuff is made up, obviously, but I don't know how to really put that much effort and time and energy into something unless it's something that, you know, sort of like my first writing teacher, write what you know, you know, it's, it's, then it's authentic. And Absolutely. And you can feel it. You can, you can feel it through the movie that it's, it's honest and it's real. And it's, and your, your movies also always feel to me like the sets, like the people on the set are all kind of united together in one concept, in one, you know, um, obviously led by you. So it feels like 
the set itself. I don't know. There's some an energy from it, you know, that you can just feel. Yeah, we usually have really, really reasonably good sets. Um, I will say um, I was the uh, bitchiest on More Beautiful, though, because I had to produce and direct. And I don't oh. usually... I hate doing it more than anything because you're constantly having to yell at people because they're not on time or they're spending money you don't have and blah, 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 blah. So, you know, and it's also the schizophrenia of the producer saying, Nicole, stop shooting this because you, you don't have any more time. And the director and me always winning who says, fuck you. I'm getting <laughs> shot. This is too important. So it's not a good, it's not good for the film for me to produce and direct at the same time. Okay. Next time get a producer. Oh, I'm already working. Oh, okay. With- the producer. Oh, and we'll we'll talk. To, I mean, as much as you can, we want to ask yeah. you later about your your new uh, movies coming up. We have an audience question. Um, oh, yeah. Which is in all of your movies, at least one of the women in the couple is an artist. Is that deliberate, and why? Uh, because artists usually are intense and feel things very emotionally, and um, they're wild and crazy and tempestuous and passionate, and so it's very easy to use them as fodder. <laughs> um, and it's it's my experience. I don't know, you know, I I live like an artist. I everything I do is like an artist. Um, you know, I drive people crazy basically <laughs> because I'm so uh, laser focused on you know those those things that are about the art that are really important to me Mm -hmm, that nobody mm -hmm. else in the world notices. So I don't know how else to, you know, um, I just think artists are fascinating. They are. Now, something that we've noticed in all your films is that you make fabulous love scenes. I mean, (laughs) they're not, I mean, it's a very delicate balance that you have to hit because on one hand you want it to be erotic, but you don't want it to be pornographic. You want it to be tasteful, but you don't want it to be too prudish. So, um, and your love scenes just hit just strike that that balance. balance. It's um, they're really perfect. I mean, we always know. I mean, even in uh, Clear of the Moon, which I, by the way, now watch for the first time. Uh, oh, my <laughs> you know, Your first time through. Okay. Um, and so, you know, we were waiting, waiting, waiting. To, and then in the end, what a payoff. I mean, yeah. even in 1992, you were yeah. able to give us that full, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and you don't just wait and wait and wait. And then you get this little, you know, you yeah. really, really get your money's worth. And the shot where she is like basically, you know, going up her and pushing her back in the head, fights galore over With who? that. In Clear of the Moon. The everybody didn't want that in there because it was too graphic. And I was like, no, I think it's really important that we have that because it's sort of like the the giving over and, and you know, the the uh, And is that a winning argument or what does it take to actually win that argument? I just finally say I'm not gonna change it. <laughs> And they let you, and they just say, "All right, that's her well, film." Well, but distributors no. and you know. no, 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 because the film by the time it gets to a distributor is always done. Mm-hmm. So it's already the, all the battles and stuff have happened during editing and screening. Um, you know, well, which I always explain to like Lisa Forehan, who's my new creative producing partner. I explained to her, "Okay, so you're going to experience the worst night of your life now, the night after we do the screening and we do the questionnaires." And it really is. It's like, that's where you find where like nobody understands this particular scene and you think it's so clear. I was reading a review about somebody who was saying in More Beautiful, they hated the narration and they hated all the over explanation. But because the film is so complex, I found out in screening, if I didn't put things that seemed so obvious to me in there, people didn't get it. So it's lots of stuff that, this is one thing that people don't understand about films um, there is a certain level of sophistication when you watch films and you're either here or here or here, or you're my mother down here who can't remember the first 10 minutes of the film and what's it, what it's about. Uh, but it's, it's, um, very difficult when you're doing something very complex, like more beautiful, or even a perfect ending where people don't get confused unless you say something really like, yes, I am an FBI agent, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. <laughs> And so those those are things that happen from test screenings, you know, but people don't know that. And there's uh, mm-hmm. sort of. I'm so happy you said that because I'm one of those people who will always say, oh, you had to point out the obvious. Hated New Yorkers <laughs> and other people. You know, I've had people who say, I have no idea what this movie was about. None at all. I don't understand any of the stuff that you were doing with that little baby and the this and the that. They don't get it. So, you know, you, you, you don't want to dumb down the film, but you also want people to 
get the basic mystery pieces, you know, so. Yeah. Interesting. So you always have to kind of hit the compromises so that That's everybody. What the are, where I'm like, there's no way they can't understand this. And they're like, don't get no. it. <laughs> I'm not a fan of narration, but when you put it that way, then I understand why at some time, yeah. sometimes it just has to be. But let's go See, back to the storytelling. Storyteller, for me, the films I love the most are when somebody said, it all started back in 1972. <laughs> I'm, I'm there. Picture Mary it, Cecily. Yeah. Um, but let's go back to the love scenes for a second. <laughs> Just because we want to know about your process in detail um, of, of the... I mean, I don't know if it just comes naturally to you and you just know how to do it, or do you actually, you know, like, how do you build the love scene and how does it work for you? Okay, so the love scenes are very, very, the most important scenes in the film. I spend the most time on them of anything. I cut them, ask anybody who's worked with me. I, I have 4,000 cuts of each love scene. And you should I put them all on the DVD, just saying. Oh, my God. It'd be 10 hours of... Of I think, nobody's I think people would be delighted. <laughs> so I am doing a special um, donor download of the love scene, just the love scene um, between the two of them that I am cutting right now, actually. Um, so uh, the first thing that I, I do is think, what is the tenor of the lovemaking supposed to be? For a perfect ending, it was very, very specific. She's never had an orgasm. So it has to be all about that. It's the most graphic scene I've done, as you all know. It's and wonderful. Barbara and Jessica were such incredible troopers. That scene took forever to shoot um, because there were a lot of things that where I let the camera roll and I'm directing them as the camera's rolling, trying to get them there. And, um, you know, Barbara, as a straight woman, was, was really having difficulty. And uh, we ended up, I did something I hate myself for. But it's one of those things sometimes you have to do. You know, her father had passed away recently and I made her go there because I needed her to break through to really experience that sort of like letting, literally letting go to let somebody inside to help heal her. And um, it was brutal on, you know, in some ways. Um, but the two of them were phenomenal. And to me, it's one of the bravest um, performances of any actress has ever given. I think Barbara and, and Jessica as well. And Jessica's love scene is every bit as exposing. Um, but it had to do with what each of them needed. Paris finally could heal, you know, from what she had done and punishing herself. Um, with Elena Undone, it was a little bit more organic because it was so based on um, Marina and I. And mm -hmm. I sat with my DP, Paul Lazar, who I love. He did both Elena Undone and A Perfect Ending. And I would shoot with him in, in a heartbeat. He's he's my, he's just a genius uh, DP. Um, I asked him if we could set up a kind of lighting design um, to come up with something with me for that scene. And we came up with that sort of beautiful bluish stuff that I just, blue obviously is a, a the warmest color mm -hmm. apparently although it's not really, <laughs> although it's not really but it don't, is don't think go there please <laughs> uh but um with uh more beautiful uh because i had done you know pretty straightforward you know uh, a goes to b to c to d you know sort of kind of thing um then and I choreograph it as like, I want this person to make love to this person first and, you know, that sort of thing, uh, depending on what the storyline is. And in More Beautiful, um, I really had wanted to do more dance of adults in She For Me. And we shot two adult dancers to represent those two girls, but it just, nothing about it worked. So um, I thought in myself, I was like, I'm going to try this someday. And so when it came to the point of, of doing the love scene, because dance was such a motif in it. I really wanted to try to do a lovemaking scene with two women dancing because I so love dance as an art. It's my other favorite, you know, art form is watching people dance. So, um, and when I conceived of it, it was like, as I think I've told you, it was either going to be the stupidest, cheesiest thing on the planet, or it might just work. And um, when, when I did the first cut, which was 10 minutes long <laughs> of that love scene, I showed it to Lisa, Jane, and Chiquinta. They, Chiquinta was visiting from Australia. And they were like, oh, my God, this is awesome. This is it. This is love. So we showed the girls. And they were like, oh, my God, this is way too long. 
<lacht> no, du weißt bei uns jetzt, ne? <lacht> My whole goal in that, because I had so many beautiful shots of these two women dancing together, was to try to figure out how do I pick the best of the best that fits the right feeling and everything else. So, again, I cut that scene up until our, like, literally locked thing. I was still cutting the scene. Um, but um, between uh, going from the sunset into that love scene and going back there to me, that is my single, every part of it is my single favorite scene ever that I've done in 30 years. So well, I'm very, I'm very proud of it and very happy with it. It's quite exquisite. And, um, I hope everybody gets to see it. Right. And actually, but before, before we go, cause we want to talk about, uh, more beautiful in detail, obviously, yeah. cause that's the newest movie. And, um, we want to, we want to let people know, um, since you were talking about Barbara being straight and doing the love scene and how it was hard for her, we were wondering, actually it was an audience question, um, because you've cast both uh, straight actresses and lesbian actresses in lesbian roles. And um, is the process different? Uh, I mean, we're assuming, and you just said that, especially when we're talking about the love scenes, but it, is it different to work with straight actresses or lesbian actresses when doing these kind of... Well, only from the standpoint that... Um uh like with 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 um Zoe and Kayla, it was only about trying to explain to them this is how it works for us, you know, and this is what feeds us and and as Kayla had said in her uh live feed, she's in the dance world, you know there's people are fluid in the dance world, pretty fluid, and Zoe is just as you know open and as wonderful as uh, you you guys know as she's mother. a darling. So they were totally, they just took in everything that we in the Silver Tribe would, you know, sort of give them as, um, you know, ideas and things along those lines. Neither of them had ever done a love scene with a straight man or a woman. Oh, interesting. It was, it was nice from that standpoint, just having people who are kind of raw so you can sort of work and, and, uh, and mold them. But um, uh, I, I really, this is one thing I believe about actors. Um, they're these magical creatures who can assume the role and that's what their job is. And so I don't ever cast whether they're gay or straight. I cast for the, the essence of who, who they are and, you know, and the chemistry between the two of them and the chemistry between the two of them is literally the most important thing. If you don't have that, why make the movie? And so that really boils down to, you know, that really defines who you're going to cast. Because, you know, there's this whole argument. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You just you do I mean, this. there's this whole argument about uh, whether only gay actors should play gay characters. And so as, as a lesbian uh, director, filmmaker, we wanted your take on, you know, obviously you feel that it shouldn't matter. I, I really believe actors are a very special breed and that one of the things that they're able to do, and that's part of their craft, is to assume the role. And some of them do it better than others. And you find the one that best fits your character. For me, you know, we had three actresses for uh, Mackenzie, three well-known actresses, television actresses that are awesome. And one of them was my first pick for five years. We got her, but we lost her over the weekend because she got a, a, a series that she was shooting for Netflix, which I just watched. Um, she was my number one person of all time. Katie Sackoff from Battlestar Galactica. Of course, yeah. uh, and we lost her over the weekend. And then we got a couple of more, of more gals that were well known. And when the last one went, uh, they were all too big in terms of their careers to be cast with Kayla. And I was, I wanted Kayla because I was so sick of what was happening in, in our casting. I need to anchor the film with one of the leads and then cast for chemistry with that person. They become the you know the focal point and she was yeah. the dancer yes and she was well she was she was originally uh cast though as the choreographer for that dance and to play the role of whoever that female was we were always going to use different dancers than the two of them that's why i feel like this became so magical because of all the happy accidents that happened along the way yes zoe told us about you know that when she came to read and uh one of the producers we had of the dancer right ever. but she yeah. assumed that that's what she what she was right. why, she, why was she was coming yes <laughs> no the reason she was coming is because when her manager first sent me her headshot i didn't care for her headshot so i didn't even look at her i didn't look at her reel and then um she she kept popping up somehow you know just in that weird way 
And I finally decided to go on YouTube and look at her on something on YouTube. And the first thing I saw was her on the red carpet in this great like black jumpsuit that was, and she turned around and the cameras are all going, Zoe, Zoe, Zoe. And she turned around and smile and that jawline and that smile. That and those smile. Eyes. I was like, oh my God. And I even said to the gal that was sitting there, I said, look at that fucking jawline. I'm in love. <laughs> Yeah, I remember that you'd emailed us and you thought you were telling us about somebody new. And I was like, we were just now binging on her show. <laughs> Unpacked to the rafters. I know, I know. So, uh, she's a wonderful yeah. choice. And then to find out that she's also a dancer. Yeah, that was just the icing on the cake because we were always going to use a, a, a body double for, for her. But um, no. And, and then, go ahead. Now, did you know from the moment that you saw them together that they were your couple? Did it just work instantly? Well, I could tell that Kayla, it worked for Kayla instantly. I was, I still wanted to see another actress that I really like, who reminds me of Tracy Dinwiddie. And it was between her and Zoe for me. But um, I also, who Zoe is, um, is so, um, there is such a wonderful way that I feel like she represents a lesbian that is like butch yet soft, you know, um, just she has all of these wonderful characteristics that make her a perfect lesbian for, in my mind. Um, and Even though so, she's not a lesbian. <laughs> no, I'm just saying there's an essence about mm -hmm. her, energy about her that is just so tough and soft. And so I just love that sort of combination and her sort of dichotomy of things in her that just really um, worked. And then when I could see what she actually could do, I was freaking blown what she could do with her eyes and stuff and the subtleties that she would, you know, because Jane Goldstein, she's like 12 years older than me, but we're kind of the same person, except for she's much crankier and meaner than I am. <laughs> uh oh. She, well, wait she, 10, 10 years and see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> she would come down and stay with me for a week and a half at a time and watch all of the things that I was doing editing. And she, could not believe because she got to see so many of the dailies all the things we would be like which take do I use this one's cool this way and this one's cool this way uh so yeah. she's something else you she's hit gold a, I hit gold yes I hit and, gold all the way around and mm -hmm. you didn't even know that before the movie would come out she would go on to play uh on Home and Away and oh. bring with her this massive following Bam. of lesbians who are like I know. I know. That's it. She's in the lesbian pantheon of, you we know. Told her that's it. She's <laughs> ours forever. Yeah, I know. I, know. I, did tell her, I did tell her, I have a role that I think you would be perfect for. Yes, it's another love story between two women, but I would cast her in Do We Not Bleed in a Heartbeat. Well, well but that would we, be great. We need to hear about Do yes. Well, we want everybody to hear about Do We Not Bleed, but before we do. Well, also, I wanted to say that I think all the casting in the movie is very good. I love Bruce Davison. I mean, he is. He just brings so much heart to everything he does. He's a he's, wonderful choice. Mm -hmm. He's not only that. He is one of those people. Like we were shoot. One of the last days we were shooting at Castaic Lake, and we're walking in the parking lot, and he puts his arm around me, and he's like, "You know, Nicole, this is what I live for. These movies. That's why I work my ass off twenty four. He's like in. A, look at his IMDb page. Everything. He's, everything. Um, he says, but this. The that's why I do it to do these, and he is just a sweetheart. I love the way he was with my daughter, I love the way he was with the whole cast. He's so entertaining, and he and French knew each other, he and Harley knew each other. He of course, and, I think they used to date, you know. He so, and who? I'm sorry, he lens. Uh, so they were so wonderful together. They just that oh, so one of the cut scenes is in the DVD extras between the two of them. It's oh, so great, cool. yeah. And what was it like working with your daughter for the first time? Oh, it was just one of the greatest gifts ever because, and you'll see in the DVD extras, there is a clip from her for two of the last theater things she did, one of which is Valma in Chicago. <gasps> oh! How different she is, yeah. You'll see how different she is in those roles and then what she plays in this is, and she'd never done film, She's but, but she's like a theater, like a serious theater actress. And so it was really fun to play with her. You know, she still has a lot of work to do, but- She's a natural. I, Yes, I've gotten so much feedback from people like your daughter is, you know, magnetic on screen. She's, you know, a natural. She's beautiful. You know, all those sorts of things. I'm really proud of her. Um, and and did she enjoy it? Oh my God, she loved it. 
And then at the end, she's like, you know, maybe I really should just stick to theater acting. And I was like, come to the movies with me. So we would go to the movies and there's somebody up on the screen that she really likes. I said, wait until you see yourself up on that screen. So when we were at the uh, premiere in Frameline, uh, I, I said to her, I said, so what do you think? She said, I want to do it some more. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet, yes. And then, of course, mm. K- Kale. Right. Kale. Mm. And you'll see pieces of Kale and Nicholas together in the DVD extras because when they first came out in 2015, Brittany brought, I had Brittany bring Kale over so that he could meet Nicholas. And so you see that little piece in the DVD extras and Nicholas goes to hug him and he's going to hug him. It's just really, oh. really sweet. How did you find him? He was him? magnificent. How did you find him? Well, we had, we had asked a couple of um, casting people and agents who dealt with actors with special needs to submit their kids. And we had one kid who was really good, but he literally had like semi CP in his hand. That was it. Oh. So it's like, no, no, we really need somebody who, you know, and so when Kale came in, he was eight at the time in 2015. And um, I mean, we just fell in love with him. But he didn't, I could tell he didn't understand the lines really well. He could repeat them, but he didn't understand the meaning behind them. So I was really glad that those two years passed because he grew and developed so much, you know, as kids do, that he was really able to handle, handle the material. Oh, he was, and oh, really? He was, uh, he, he was a pro. He, He's an amazing, he's like literally the real deal as far as an entertainer goes. Because when he's not acting, he's, you know, hamming it up and in, in a really fun, fun way. He's so clever. He's so fucking freaking clever. You can and say that's okay. not the lady part we're, we're TV on, show. We're, we're online. online. <laughs> you know, um, just so flipping clever and funny and loving. And oh, God, when we did the when we did the scene where we had to put all the stuff on for him medically mm-hmm. that my son goes through, mm-hmm. it was really, really hard for him. And he was so like tender and raw. And he, we just had a love fest in there doing that to try to get him through that because it reminded him of when he has to go to the hospital and have all those things done to him. So, well, the emotionality of making this film for you must've been besides all the things that were happening in your life, just the fact that you're again, replicating something in your life that's yeah. uh yeah the, so important. Shot the love scene the real love scene not the dance scene he was 103 and a half and I was losing my mind trying to get through the love scene so that I could deal with because I didn't know if he had to go to the hospital because he gets pneumonia so quickly um he turned out being fine it wasn't until I was like in my first cut that he ended up back in the hospital and we got interrupted for a period of time but and in, yeah. and doing this story was that therapeutic or was that hard or both well, in May of 2018, when I was when I had done the first cut, I'm sitting. We didn't know what was wrong with him. We had to rush him into the hospital because he couldn't breathe. And he, we, when we found out, we got him to the hospital. They ran all kinds of tests. They had no idea what was wrong with him. They had to put him in ICU right away. Put him, you know, get him on a ventilator. The whole thing. He hadn't been on a ventilator since he was in, in the in the NICU, and he was septic as hell. And oh my God! I just thought, you know, again. That's it. We don't know what's go- going on. So he laid there in bed for five days, not moving a twitch. And I, I have a diary entry where I wrote, what the fuck am I doing making a movie? They're like, what the fuck is wrong with you, Nicole? You've got a kid here who's about to fucking die on you and you're fucking making a movie. You know, I just went into that whole. I would like, think that that's, that's something that's like a lifeline to keep you sane. I mean, going yeah. through all of this, all these years. Yeah. You got to hang it, on to something. And people don't get the PTSD factor. This virus for me with Nicholas is the most single terrifying thing I've ever experienced outside of him actually being in the hospital because his lungs are so trash that he would never, the way this attacks your lungs, he would never, he would never make it. He would just never make it. Well, just so, keep him in a bubble. <laughs> yeah. In a bubble. He's in a big, big bubble right now. Good. But, um, but, but I'm sure people would want to know, how is he doing? He's doing really, really, really well. Did he and already turn 18? Yes, he turned 18 March 15th. Wow. He had to cancel his birthday because of the virus and everything else. But um, uh, he reads, he makes sentences, he can count to 100, and he always says, I'm your good boy. <laughs> wow. Well, you're a, a, an amazing mother. You are. The, the most He's the devoted greatest. human person I know. <laughs> 
No, I'm I like that's why I made this movie. We're the lucky ones. Yes. That have kids like Nicholas and Kale. They bring so much more to our lives than otherwise. And, you know, cheesy, corny, I know, but he is my greatest teacher, without a doubt. Well, you the know. film shows that. I, I, the Absolutely. film really does. Yeah. Oh, good. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad that gets across. Yeah. Because oh. To me, that's the, that's the message, you know. Well, I think, first of all, it's, it's all of your love. And, you know, it, it's all, you can feel it. You can sense it from, from every scene. And I love those special, when you have those, um, you know, visions through his eyes, yeah. how he sees the oh, world. That was it's such great. a beautiful touch. Um, and of course, uh, he is just such a wonderful, beautiful actor that he infuses the movie with so much love and spirit. And I love that he falls in love with Mackenzie first. <laughs> yes, me too. That's the thing. That's yes, and, the and that's what we told Zoe because, and actually, we will get into the love scene now and the whole controversy of having to cut it out of the film. Um, but we told we, we were talking to Zoe, and we said, you know, actually, the way we see it is the first love story is between. Freddie and uh, Mackenzie. Yeah. And so it's actually a movie about Freddie and his life and his family. And the fact that he has a lesbian mother is just kind of an incidental thing because it's you and you yeah. could do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He opened her heart. It was a uh, very, uh, yeah. He yeah. helped her heal from her own yeah. trauma and her own demons. That's good. Yeah. He got right in there. He warmed right in. And he also, she didn't wanted, protest very much. And he also wanted the shit for his mother. Yes. <laughs> Exactly. Yes. Um, so tell us, we want to give you the platform now to just kind of tell people, because we know it's, you know, we don't know how clear it's been. We want you to just go on the record and say why you chose to cut the love scene and where, most importantly, where people can actually watch the movie in full, the director's cut. Okay. Okay. The, the cutting of the love scene is literally a matter of what platforms will take and what they won't take. And it boils down to this. There are platforms that won't take love scenes between women, men, cats, dogs, you name it. They just won't take a love scene. And for those platforms, the love scene is cut. And, um, you know, Vision explained this to me and Vision Films, who is our, our worldwide distributor and owned by Lisa Romanoff, who is an extraordinary woman who's been doing this for, you know, 30 years who is so behind this film that she was willing to allow us to bifurcate the deal and make a deal with Wolf Video so that they could bring the, the movie, the director's cut movie and VOD director's cut to the lesbian community as they put the film in their mind. This is a family drama. Uh, the love, the love scene and the, the uh, love story between um, Mackenzie and Samantha, they think is totally beautiful um, and completely are behind it, but they can't sell it to those platforms. And for all of us, we agreed that it was much more important to have the film about this little boy out there without the love scene um, for that, for those platforms. Everywhere else it will be available. Um, even, you know, I just got the list of uh, territories from, from South, South Africa. Yeah, there's thousands. Yeah, everybody can see it on iTunes and all of these different regions. And I'll get the the uh, other countries for Google Play and all of that, and we'll be posting those everywhere. So but, iTunes and all that, all those are the full director's cut. Yes, yes. Oh, so Absolutely. where, so where is the censored version? On those platforms, like for Comcast and Spectrum, I guess you know wherever those platforms are. Basically, they just don't want love scenes, and they probably have to cut for time on top of those things. And the love scenes, I, I guess they think can go, and maybe their their sponsors don't support that. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Yes, artistically for me, it's hard for people to not see the film with the love scene because the way I crafted and cut it was to present lovemaking between two women in a very non-threatening, non-challenging way, I thought. Totally. Um, yes, and, and they also chose to cut even the, the dance parts of the love scene. Yes, I mean, that. I think they just lifted that. I haven't seen it yet, um, but I... You know, at some point I, I will look at it when I have a, a minute to to not be releasing the movie. Um, but uh, for for me, having more people see the film and seeing Kale and the character of Freddie and the difference that he makes in all of these people's life is the important part of this film. Yes. Yes. The other love story is also important. Um but anybody can see that on the director's cut, which is available. Well, and, so and, and also the, the love, love story, story is still, still there, there, just not yes. the scene. Exactly. And yes. that is very important. Right. Places to have this film go to people who 
wouldn't seek out a, a, yes. a love story between two women, but they'd go to see a story about this boy. And then just, just by the way, yeah, she, two women fall in love. And I think that that is something that we need. And yes. if uh, you have to sacrifice a love scene to move forward another yes. inch in the world, yeah. yes. I think that well, nobody should object to especially that. Especially if they're equal opportunity, uh, Yes, you know, I mean, if they, they, they cut out all love yeah. scenes. It's not yes, just... Yes, they're equal opportunity censors. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I, I can't rave enough about Vision because between Lisa and Kristen Bedna, who's their marketing and uh, domestic uh, person, they they are on the phone and emails all day long helping try to figure out how to make this movie get out to as many places as possible. I just talked to their straight publicist and she loves the film and she's got all kinds of ideas about where to pitch it and all, all of those sorts of things. Um, I think that uh, Wolf Video, Vision, the UK, uh, Les Flix, and we will, and we now can say in Australia, it's Bounty Entertainment. I will get be getting the links very sh soon. So sorry, Aussie ladies who I love. Um, we will be getting that information out to you soon, but uh, they're very... They just want everybody in the world to see it. And they've been incredible. Wonderful. And I, you know, I, I really like these women a lot. So that's great. Awesome. Well, I hope you get to uh, work with them again. Um, Cause I've seen a lot, so much, there's so much going on. I mean, a lot of it is online, but there's a lot going on about this film. I love yes. the artwork. I, I love, uh, yeah. yeah I, yes, but I, the next film does have to have a, an extensive love scene. So. Well, of course, <laughs> it just has to be able to be taken out. It seems it, it is. It's got a very unique love scene. Oh, you keep teasing us. Okay, What's it called on. again? Something with blood. Do we not bleed? Do we not bleed? <laughs> Shylock. Um, yeah. Prick us. Do we not? Prick bleed? us. Do we not bleed? But before we go there, I'm sorry because we are talking about the cutting of the love scene and the sorry, distribution. Sorry. No, 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 no. This is what happens. It's fine. We're I'm just having this, a conversation. My my job is just to make sure I don't forget to ask you anything. Mm -hmm. um, we do have an audience question because it is on the topic. And so, um, how difficult is it to get financing for for well for your movies? Let's say, and is it if it's hard? Is it because it's about lesbians, about women, or because movies are just hard to make in general? Okay. Well, it is almost impossible to make any movie. Period. <laughs> let's just start there. <laughs> let's just start there. Uh, I am very, very blessed that from Claire of the Moon on, I have a fan base that has supported my films. The last three films I crowdfunded. Um, and I really believe there is a level of crowdfunding fatigue, which we, we've talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem isn't so much getting the money. It, the problem is making the money back. And having money in the in the middle of it, um, and that has been the things that have killed so many of these smaller projects. For instance, I had 18 different producers on More Beautiful in those six years. 18, and because you have to end up using your own money, and because you have to end up doing all the stuff yourself with no money, people go by the wayside. They're excited for six months, and then they you know they can't do it. They can't afford to do it. Um, uh, so basically, what I discovered traveling the festival circuit for six, seven months with More Beautiful was so heartbreaking in terms of attendance, in terms of what they were programming, all of those sorts of things sort of led me to the like light bulb realization that we so badly wanted to be assimilated and integrated. And we have been, we have our own shows, Gentleman Jack, Orange, um, L word, the new They're all word. over the place. Over. We're tokens in every single sitcom. We're tokens in every drama. We're tokens every single place. But the one thing I've gotten back repeatedly from women who say they don't like the way the festivals are programming because there's just too much, you know, political stuff, too many boys' movies, not enough, like just your basic drama romance. Um, that there's still a real hunger for films made for, by, and about women. Um, it's just that now that we're so integrated and we've lost all of our coffee houses, our magazines, our ways that we connected with each other, we're having to re figure that all out now on the internet. And that's what we're trying to do. And that's what I'm trying to do with a whole new, um, my new hybrid funding model, which is 
part subscription, part donor, part cash for credits, and part investment. And it's de I designed it for all the different lesbians I met along the festival circuit, some of whom have absolutely no money but can afford $1.99 a month to try to ensure that they get a quality movie later on. Others who have more money who want to, you know, to buy a autographed whatever, and they can get a donor reward. But the whole point of it is, is to try to keep it ongoing because during this particular film, for instance, I had out-of-pocket expenses from late 2013 and have shit tons more by 2020. And there's no paycheck on this movie for six to nine months after distribution. So for this entire time, I've lived off royalties from my other films, which always dwindle as the years go by after their release. And it's very, very difficult to make any kind of living, especially if you live in high priced LA. So, um, and I cannot leave this state because my son's services here would never be um, available to him in any other state in the country. So what I'm trying to do is uh, try to figure out a, a destination hub, not just for my films, but also to try to help um, develop, co-produce and executive produce other women's films. What we want to try to do is become a destination for lesbian film fundraising, lesbian in the arts. We're going to uh, have a lot of different things that we're, we're doing with this destination hub, but I have talked to several different other lesbian um, online destination hubs who want to partner with me to do this because it's such a powerful tool to be able to try to get anybody who's trying to make a lesbian movie, come here and let's see how we can help you. And we also may eventually um, partner with a woman that we talked to yesterday to have lesbians who have artwork, but it's straight material to give to her who she wants to do kind of the same end with all women, straight women. Um, so it's kind of one of those things that we're really excited about. And everybody we've talked to about it is super excited. I know you guys and we spoke about the subscription model and how difficult it is for women to part with their money. It's, it's difficult. Even if it's for, a couple of dollars. Yeah, even a couple of dollars a month. I, I know. know why. But I'm, I'm not presenting this as what do I get for my dollar ninety nine. It's um, what do I hope to achieve with my dollar mm -hmm. ninety nine, and that we'll get a good movie every two to three years because something will always be in development, something will always be in production, and something will always be in post production. And so um, I think I told you we have this uh, romantic comedy, uh, Racing Hearts, about two Formula One race car drivers right, right. Um, who I'm going to write with Lisa, uh, my creative uh, producing partner. And but I want a different director for it. It's not my genre. So I want to bring in a lesbian director who's a happening young lesbian director and do that with her. It's very or smart. Or co-produce with another lesbian production entity so that we can be better together, you know, essentially. And so my, so my tagline is very long, buy for and about keeping lesbian women, uh, lesbian cinema and arts alive. And so. what, what, what people need, what women need to do and what lesbians need to do or women in the queer community need to do is put their money where their mouths are. And, um, and stop bitching. And, and, and well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, we actually have a question about that. Um, Stop because, bitching, it's right. <laughs> uh, because, you know, they, they want it. They want it, they want it, they want it, but then they resent being asked to take part in it. And the thing is, is that it's so hard to make movies that, you know, I mean, let's face it, all these big studios, they want something that's already proven. They can put, you know, bring yeah. people to theaters. It has an action hero in it usually. And they're not or interested. Five. Right. And they're not interested in these smaller movies that they consider niche movies. But we are we are a niche that's hungry. For, I mean, again, as many as many, as you said, token here, token there. It's not. And that's something that actually we, we took that question out. But <laughs> but I just I'll just take have a, as an observation that I, what I love about your movies is that it's just an, a, a good old fashioned lesbian storyline, lesbian love story. You know, it's it's just we need that kind of stuff. We don't have much of that. And also Straight it's people a, have so much of it's it. About, they're about adults. Yes, and that is the other thing. It's called the adult love story, which is right. very, very rare. That's why rom-coms are so big, because dealing with the actual seriousness of those kind of emotional feelings and stuff, people just don't like to do that. It's hard. It's hard to do that and then recreate those feelings. And so um, I always call it an adult love story. Uh, and my favorite films are adult love stories, you know, that are really adult, like um, 
one of my favorites is Sigourney Weaver and Mel Gibson in. Oh, uh, uh, the oh. one about bank. Uh, the what about yeah. uh, Ty? What's it called? Yeah. It's one of my favorite films with Linda seen. Hunt. You're living dangerously. Living, oh, you're living dangerous. It's a fantastic movie. Romantic movies. Such an adult love story, and so well done. And what was that gal who played the Linda uh, Hunt? Linda Hunt. Oh my God, I love her. Love. That was love. how we discovered Linda Hunt. That was her first big movie. Yes, I know. I and, remember. And she played a man. Yes, she did. And it she was did. just. She's amazing. Well, I'll never forget that movie. And Mel Gibson was so beautiful. Too bad he grew up to be yeah. such a jackass. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, and Sigourney, she was at her prime. Oh, I know. She, I mean, she's always fabulous. Though, she's I'm always. Sure. I. So we have. So we know what we need to do. We need for, when when the time comes and this this uh, you know you have it ready and for people to well, actually I come on. Have, I should have the website up in two weeks. I meet oh. with my some of the uh, Rochelle and Lisa and Sally Ann. I'm meeting with them Sunday to go over the final mission statement and the final donor gifts and subscription gifts and stuff along those lines. I want to have this, uh, this live in two weeks because I want to start sending women to it and having them understand co sort of what the, the, the deal is. Plus I've run out of money to market the film. And so that's another reason I want to get it up. Mm -hmm. and, and this is, people well, should know, even though, even though you've, the, the, the movie has been sold out, basically, yep. the pre-orders, and you're still not seeing a dime from it. I won't see a dime probably for nine months. Okay, so that's because, something that people should yeah, understand. Well, we want to buy the film. Now you say Amazon is out. Where can we buy this? the DVD? Okay, the DVD you can get from a link that I will give to you uh, that's directly to Wolf Video for the director's cut. Um, I just don't have it. That's like, okay. I, that's all right. If, if it's the I, link we don't need it right this minute. No, no, we won't remember. I already have the link. Oh, you have it. Unless it's something She has new. everything. Yeah. We're telling people you need to, uh, you're going to have this model. People can participate, can actively participate in helping making movies. You are definitely devoted and dedicated and We'll go on making movies as much as you can, as much as people will help you make them, right? Yes, absolutely. You already have, I know, two more movies that you're... Mm -hmm. So and now, tell us about... Sorry? Okay. I said, and a documentary that we're interested in doing about soulmates. Uh, uh, Sally Ann and her partner, she wrote a memoir. They were two of the really um, outspoken and uh, sort of, um, what do you call it? Uh, they were used in all of the news about gay marriage. Uh -huh. Yeah. So they have a really great story and they have a lot of foot, you know, footage and photos from all of that time that they were in the papers and stuff along those lines uh, about how they ended up connecting by a literal transposition of a thing in an email. They weren't, they were not supposed to get each other's emails. And from that, that email, they ended up falling madly in love. And it's, that's so great. The, the uh, memoir is called light at the end of the tunnel by Sally Ann Monty. You can get it on Amazon. Uh, she's one of our global film gals that you guys know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so we talked about all the different kinds of soulmates there can be. Like Nicholas is a soulmate of mine. It has nothing to do with being in love in that way, but it's a totally different kind of way. So we thought talked about th those pieces. Um, but the other two films, one is the rom, the Racing Hearts rom com, and the other one is Do We Not Bleed, which is about halfway written. Um, I was working on it this morning. In fact, had a great writing session right before I jumped on. Great. The and um, it's uh, it's very dark. I like dark. But there's a lot of humor in it to lighten that. But it's a love story between uh, two women who are in absolute, like, uh, horrific grief, you know, based on my experiences after my sister and stuff. And um, they are both married and not lesbians. And um, but they meet at this grief group and n neither one of them are willing to do any work to get better because they're both so shattered and the only person that they can actually heal with is each other. And so that ends up becoming, you know, a beautiful love story. And there's a bunch of other things that are going on. It sounds well. great. Do I remember correctly? Is this, there an age difference there? No, that's another one. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's our story. <laughs> that's our story. Yeah. <laughs> do we not age? <laughs> do we not age? You don't, and I do. <laughs> Well, someday we'll we'll uh, sell the copyrights to our. Yes, uh, I know. No, I will write it. <laughs> I am a writer. I just don't write. Soulmates documentary. We're here. We're here. Yeah. Available. Yep. We've been in documentaries. We were in uh, Between the Shades. Yeah. Uh, uh, a wonderful documentary about uh, about just love just and love. how love happens and the very the different definitions of love and gender and. 
<laughs> yeah, we were also one of those things where we were, we were at a screening and we sat next to this woman. We started chatting. She said, you, you seem like an interesting couple. Would you be in my documentary? <laughs> I kind of you know, you guys are a great couple. That's what I love about you. Well, well there's, there's only, only 34 years between us. Oh, I don't know what's so big. Come together, and I I never see age difference with you ever. I don't even it doesn't even enter my mind until we had that conversation the other day. Well, I'm uh, very immature, and she's very mature. <laughs> well, that's what I told her. the other day. I told her because she she said something. I mean, you said something about uh, like that we're like an un unlikely couple or something and i said well in our daily lives do you ever feel our ages and she never said, no so what in more fact she treats me like a child often so. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway this isn't about us um <laughs> yeah. what do you like to watch on uh, television or movies what do you like to watch well um i am a political freak so I am always watching my new favorite, Nicole Wallace on MSNBC. Oh, we love her. Can you believe she is a Republican? She, she used to be a Republican. I know. I know. She was Bush's uh, yes. communication She was Sarah Paulson in her. Game Change. Yes, Sarah yeah. Paulson. Just like, she is to me, like, okay, so this is the way I say it. Like, if um, Rachel Maddow was Shirley MacLaine, <laughs> Nicole Wallace is Grace Kelly. I've also, uh, I also watched the best documentary I've seen in forever about my favorite writer, Margaret Atwood. Oh, Dude. oh yes. I've heard about that. Uh, it's on Hulu. Do not miss it. She is such an icon. She's my, literally my single favorite writer and she's just so amazing. Did, did you watch Handmaid? Oh God. Yes. <laughs> of course she watched Handmaid. Just checking. <laughs> because not just the story and because I read Handmaid's Tale like three times, but, um, because the cinematography, awesome. the production values. It's a are master class. Mind blowing. It, it yeah. is. The, sometimes I just gasp at a I'll single image, at an image. Like the drone shots when the red. Of all the red. Yeah, like, oh my because God. Because also they're so. I'm totally they're they're so, very visual. The and color I just, schemes. I, they're just constantly bombarding you with these and small and big and uh, everything about it. it every single thing about it is just brilliant yes and my favorite person in that is um Yvonne Strahovski Strahovski yes. <laughs> <laughs> wait till you see Sleepless to, to word work with her in a film so she this would have been my our next question your dream casting her and um I'm looking for an American Indian or Eastern Indian actress for Do We Not Bleed. I don't know why. It just seems like it's important to me. How about <laughs> Nikar Zadigan? <laughs> oh. I don't know if she'll do another lesbian movie, though, with her career the way it is. Yeah, her career is zooming. Yeah. But who knows? It was a good experience, right? Where yeah, she... I mean, she, I think she got a lot of good stuff from it. You and... know what, though? I, we, we asked Zoe this, and I loved her answer. She was because... actually going to read for Mackenzie because my casting director had worked with her and uh, sent out a thing, and she was going to be in Portland and fly in and do the thing, but she couldn't make it. So there getting... you see, she's open. Well, we, when we asked Zoe, because she did two gay roles in a row, and we said, you know, there are a lot of actors don't want to play too many gay roles. They're afraid of being pigeonholed. And she said, well, there were two good roles. That's all that matters, you know. And I just loved how simple that was. Who cares if they were gay, straight? And thank goodness that seems to be uh, opening up now. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know, and that's that's what I'm hopeful hopeful for. Um, so if you've any, we, if, we're also talking about Elaine Hendricks, who I really really like. Even I don't know a, her. Oh yeah, you do. You've seen her in Parent Trap as the crazy bitchy girlfriend. Uh, the we remake. haven't seen. I, I saw the original. <laughs> Check her out on IMDb. Okay. She'd be perfect for one of the roles as well in, okay. in this film. And do we not leave? So if you have, if you had Yvonne Strahovski, who would be her lover? Who would you cast as her lover? Zoe. <laughs> <laughs> they would be divine together. You know, I, really I and like truly, that. you must. It, it, it'll be on Netflix. We don't yes. know when. It just finished in uh, Australia. Stateless. Stateless. That Kate Blanchett uh, produced. Uh, okay. And also... And she's in it, but in a small she's role. She's in it, but in Yvonne a small role. She's so grotesque and phenomenal. But she's but so Yvonne, she is. Yeah. And Yvonne is the centerpiece. And um, we always thought that she should have gotten so many Emmys for Serena Joy every year. She's and stunning know. and Golden Globes. You know, she will. she's happening. She's amazing. Yeah. She is ama She's an amazing actress. And my God, there's just something about her that's so. She's got incredible qualities. She's very She's vulnerable. a phenomenal actress. You'll see her in Stateless, too. So uh, the question that we like to 
end our interviews in is, Mimi? If you were queen for a day, what would be your first order of business? To get rid of Trump. <laughs> yes. That would be So you would too. be with Zoe who said she would just make Elizabeth Warren president. That's what Zoe said. She'd no, make Elizabeth Warren. I, I would make Kamala Harris president. Yes. So would we. That's that. She was our choice, too. Either but way. I would go change my queen for a day. Okay. I would remove Trump and put Kamala Harris there and get rid of all, all the rest. And Mitch, Mitch McConnell. McConnell. Mitch McConnell. All the idiots in the, yeah, all yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today, Nicole, and for being so open, open. and generous and, and sharing everything. And I think everybody will be really happy for, what is it, like two hours now? Nah, an hour and a half. A long time, but it was really, we've been we wanting like to, to do, do it for depth. so long. We like to do in-depth. You know, well, we do people that. can ask you guys are so awesome at this. You ask all the right questions. You really do your prep and research, which I really, really love. And because you know me, yes. you know the questions to ask and I just love chatting with you anyway so just well, like we love chatting with you chat, chat yeah. with the girlfriends that's what uh Zoe said that's too. what we aim and for. we didn't know her yeah. well I she, know. Was, she was so easy to talk to I mean you know I told you she well Kayla and she are both just the sweetest funniest just loving wonderful people just wonderful, wonderful, good, good people. Good. I'm, I, well, it shows through, and I think uh, I think this film is going to be very successful. I think it really is. Uh, you. And you're really on the right marketing track with it, uh, and you've got a beautiful cast. It's a beautiful. It's beautiful to look at. That's another one of your hallmarks that I forgot. I to. just yeah. wish you could see it in the big screen because when you do, it that love scene is like blows you out of your seat when it's on that big screen so yeah, yeah i bet well Sorry. maybe we'll have a chance i hope i hope more people will have, i mean and right now it's you know yeah nobody we'll, goes we'll out do anyway but. screenings with it um yeah. because it really is a and that's you know all the beautiful the scenery gorgeous gorgeous so and we can't wait for your next movie which Thank maybe we'll, we're hoping to maybe get a, a an advanced reading of just saying well, <laughs> get my scripts <laughs> that's always one of my reading sets because i love your notes and feedback and i love your casting ideas great well, well, we're you. always I, here for hey, that i know you said wendy probably wouldn't do a small role but she i wrote a role for her with her name <laughs> in, as wendy as the therapist who runs through the entire i didn't say she would no no in fact, wendy does do many small you roles said, yeah, I know, but it's just kind of playing the therapist and the, always this and that. The, you know, that. I was just saying, but if I she's was re selfish, selfishly, I wanted her to be. Oh, yeah, one she's of the, through the film. Through the film. Yeah, you know, I'm just saying selfishly. She would be perfect because, first of all, her warmth is so. Her, and intelligence. I would buy her totally as this therapist that I'm writing. I mean, I'm writing it with her in mind. Head and heart. I mean, I don't know yeah, how she's many. She's perfect. And. Uh, uh, she has a huge following. She has a great deal of gravitas, she's and she's also icon. a darling, darling mm -hmm. woman. Yes, yeah, and she would definitely. I'm just saying, I want her to be part of the couple because I'm selfish. I want to see her. No. So the maybe, next film, maybe for the age difference one, please. Okay, <laughs> okay. that would be even better because then I will feel like it's about us. <laughs> let's let's wait. get everybody going on that website contributing as much as they can in whatever way they can and let's make more and it this way it feels like a, a, a joint effort we've all made this these films oh, and together may i say that you know women who are supporting of my films if they go to ncff nicole con film family not nicole con film family but ncff as a facebook group um we are looking for more people to become beautiful warriors who help repost for us because the more reposting you and word of mouth the better this film does. And with the social media that we've done so far, it's really, really paying off. And so any gals who want to come and be part of the, we're just like a big play group on some levels. Um, we yes, get and you've been doing live videos with, with right, Kayla, you had, with you. Right, you had Kayla on. Yeah. Uh -huh. yep. And uh, we'll be up in a couple of weeks again uh, explaining the, the subscription funding model. And um, This is a community well, joint effort. Can anyway. You yeah. It's uh, it's very exciting, and I see I see the future looking brighter. And, yes, for and thank you for everything you do for the community. I mean, thank you know, it it's it means a lot because we know that it's a labor of love and uh, it's hard work. So I have really, you. really this time around more than any other time. I've gotten so many people saying I've seen all your films. Thank you for what you do for the community, and I, it feels really, really good. And I feel very, very 
honored really that um, people recognize that about what, what I'm trying to do. So, yes. Well, I, they we do and you. they'll continue to. And meanwhile, Lola is about yes. to eat a microphone <laughs> over there. She is. <laughs> She's playing with my microphone, which costs a lot of money. <laughs> Cats. Anyway, we love you so much. We love Thank you, you for Nicole. joining us. Thank you so much. And we'll I be talking to you soon. You guys are my favorite New Yorkers. <laughs> wow, that's saying a lot. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.